Good morning. Lovely to see you this morning and my first time live, as it were, in church. <laughs> Quite a funny experience, actually. The forgiveness of Christ or the forgiveness of Jesus. I'll tell you, it's a difficult situation when you actually face the issue of forgiveness. It's, f it's quite abstract otherwise. But I want to talk about today the fact that we can forgive generously because he has forgiven us abundantly. And I want to read a couple of verses um, from Matthew 18, first of all, 15 to 17, and then 21 onwards. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And dropping down to verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. And he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what, he had, what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how your heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. A 32-year-old milk truck driver, Charles Carl Roberts, carrying three guns and a childhood grudge, stormed a one-room Amish schoolhouse on Monday the 2nd of October 2006. He sent the boys and the adults outside, barricaded the doors and by, uh, with four by fours, and then opened fire on the 10 girls that were left, six to 13 years of age. Five of them were killed outright, and then he committed suicide. Shootings in the US are quite common. Do you know there's 365 what they call mass killings in the US every year, or one for every day? Um, but what happened afterwards was so amazing that it hit the headlines and caused all world news all the way around. The Amish community raised money for the family of the man who had murdered their own children. They also took food down to their home, to the wife and the children that were living. When asked how this was possible, one Amish woman said, This is possible if you have Christ in your heart. New York Times journalist Tom Shackerman wrote, this is the imitation of Christ at its most naked. About half the 75 mourners at Charles Roberts' funeral were Amish. Forgiveness is only really possible in its ultimate sense if you have experienced the mercy of Christ Jesus. Now, Peter had been listening to Jesus talk about disputes resolution in verses 15 to 17, and trying to impress, he picks up with Jesus and asks the question, how many times should he forgive his brother? The rabbinical law, the Jewish law, said three times. I won't quote the verse, but it said three times, and then it's out. You don't have to forgive anymore. So I guess what Peter did is he doubled the number and added one for good measure. And seven is the perfect number after all, isn't it? And uh, so there he is. You can imagine him sitting back with a smile on his face, 
and uh, thinking what a great guy he is. And he was expecting Jesus to be impressed. And Jesus wasn't impressed. The master's answer still stuns us. Seven, hardly. Try 77 times, or seven times 70, because the translation can work both ways. And if you're pausing to multiply 70 times seven, you've missed the point. Because keeping tabs on mercy, Jesus is saying, is not being merciful. He does not give us a maths lesson, but a grace lesson. You can't truly forgive if you're keeping records, whether it's 70 times 7 or 77 times. Now, I have to tell you that Jesus' statement raises major problems for me, and I think probably for all of us here and who those online. Does Jesus require that we place ourselves completely at the mercy of an uncaring and unrepentant sinner? <clears throat> Does he eliminate tough love solutions to such problems as alcoholism or addiction or abuse? Does he require the kind of passivity that would make us an easy mark for unscrupulous people? Well, we find the answer to such questions in verses 15 to 20, where Jesus outlines a rigorous po process for dealing with an unrepentant brother or sister, a process that if not dealt with properly or not handled by the person can eventually lead to excommunication. Jesus clearly intends for us to take serious problems seriously. The goal of the discipline in verses 15 to 20 is the restoration of unrepentant sinners. The goal of verses 21 to 35 is the forgiveness of repentant sinners. And that forgiveness is an amazing, incalculable level of forgiveness. The story that follows as Jesus tells what is a parable, and not, by the way, an allegory, so you can't push it too far, is impressive. He says, basically, the guy owned 10,000 talents. Let me help you understand that. A talent is the largest unit of money there was. One talent equals 6,000 denarii. One denarii was a laborer's daily wage. 10,000, the number he picks of talents, is the largest number for which the Greeks had a word. So when Jesus says 10,000 talents, he's multiplying the largest unit of money by the largest Greek number, and the result is unimaginably large. The equivalent of working man's wages for 60 million days or 200,000 years. That's one impressive debt. And we know because it's a parallel that what it's saying here is God is the king, we're the debtors, and we have a debt that he has forgiveness of, that he has been merciful towards us. But is he exaggerating when he uses his 10,000 talents? Let's calculate our indebtedness to him. How often do you sin in an hour? Well, if we take the idea that sin is falling short... So, for example, worry is falling short of faith. Impatience is falling short of kindness. The critical spirit is falling short of love. How often do you come up short with God? For the sake of discussion, let's say 10 times an hour. Then let's multiply that by 16 waking hours a day, <clears throat> assuming we don't sin in our sleep. 365 days a year times the average male span of 74 years, and if we round it around, it's about 4,300,000 ,000 sins. Tell me, how do you plan to pay God for your 4.3 million sin increments? Your payout is unachievable. You're swimming in an Atlantic, so, uh, Atlantic Ocean of debt. Jesus' point precisely. See, the forgiveness of Jesus is incalculable. The depth of the forgiveness, the quantity of the forgiveness is incalculable. It costs God everything. Ephesians 1, 17, or 7, I should say, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. And our forgiveness towards others must reflect the mercy that we have been shown. See, this is a parable, by the way, 
and not an allegory. So, for example, the king commands that the man, his wife, and his kids be put in prison, and he, he confiscates all his goods and, and stuff. But we know under Jewish law, you weren't allowed to do that. And God, who wrote the law, wouldn't have made that kind of decision. So it's a parable, not an allegory. The sale was a gesture, in any case, not a settlement. The top price of a slave was about one talent. And usually less was realized when they were sold. So the debt was unpayable. With all his assets lost, there was no chance for ever being free again. So justice, if you're going to deal with this, justice was no use to him. Mercy was his only hope. And it's ironic, isn't it, that when he subsequently tried to get his debt from another person, what he was asking for was one six hundred thousandth of the debt that he had been forgiven, equivalent to 20 weeks' wages. The guy could have paid it off in five months. Do we settle our accounts do we deal with the forgiveness that we deal with by justice or according to mercy? Forgiveness is being merciful. You know, in the old days, when you had a problem, you'd say, I'm going to demand satisfaction of you at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, which meant you had to meet the person with pistols or swords, and you had to fight until one of you died. That was demanding satisfaction. There's no satisfaction in this. You don't go for satisfaction when you're forgiving. It's about mercy. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As the Lord forgave you. But I'm interested in the number that Jesus comes up with, whether that's 70 times 7 or 77 times. Why did Jesus use that number? Did he just pluck it out from nowhere? Or was there some sort of context to it? Well, maybe he was touching back on um, something that had come up many, many years, hundreds of years before, when Lamech, who had heard about Cain and the fact that there was a, 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 a thing on Cain, God put a, a curse on Cain, that if anybody tried to kill him, then he would be pay for it seven times over. And Lamech, hearing this, says, if someone kills Cain and is punished seven times, then the one who kills me will be punished 77 times. He's talking about revenge. So Jesus is counterpointing to revenge. And he's basically saying, we don't do it that way. When people do us wrong, we don't go for revenge. In fact, in verses 15 to 17, it's all about the other person's benefit. Show him his fault. About the good of the church and about the well-being of our own souls. But I want to suggest to you there was something else. 70 times 7, or 70 sevens, is an allusion to Daniel 9, 24. I'm going to quote the verse. 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness. When Peter asks how many times he should forgive his brother, Jesus answers with a riddle whose solution reveals the very year in which God would forgive the sins of the whole world. The 77s is a period of 490 years, terminating in A.D. 33, the year of Christ's crucifixion. Jesus tells his disciples to forgive 77 times 7, but his answer reveals a hidden meaning, an act of such magnificent forgiveness, such amazing forgiveness, that it touched the whole world. And it was brought about by such great humiliation and great suffering, and yet the whole world was forgiven. There isn't a man or woman, child, in this world today whose sins are not covered by Jesus Christ. He generously gave, mercifully gave forgiveness. And he put an end to sin and brought atonement for all wickedness. He sets the gold standard of forgiveness. There's a great story by Victor Hugo called Le Miserable. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's about a peasant who was sentenced to hard labor for stealing a ro loaf of bread. Eventually, he was released from jail, and his name, Jean, I hope I can pronounce this, I'm very good with French, Jean Valjean, 
was offered brief sanctuary by a priest, so allowing him to live in his home. And he abuses the trust this priest has shown him by stealing the priest's valuable silverware. And when he's caught by the priest, who catches him in the very act, he beats the priest up, and that's how he gets away. Well, he's caught by the police, and he's brought back to the house, and laughingly, they say to him, or they say to this priest, this man claims you gave him the silver. And the priest immediately replies, why, yes, there you are, my friend. You left so quickly, you didn't take the two silver candelabras. Just a moment. And he disappears into the house and returns with the silver candelabras, and he hands them to this guy, Valjean, and says this in a quiet whisper. Don't forget what your freedom has cost me. Now live your life accordingly. The forgiveness of Jesus is so amazing, so full, so rich, so powerful, so overwhelming that it's cost him hugely. And we're to live our lives accordingly. When we appreciate the mercy, not the justice, the mercy that he has shown us and extended to our lives and continues to do so, that makes the world of a difference because he who is forgiven much loves much. You know, the alternative to forgiveness is bitterness and resentment. <clears throat> bitterness burrows into us. It replays in our minds. It forms ruts by down which our thought processes run. It causes us to retell to anyone who was prepared to listen our grievances so that we can enlist their support. The resentment spills over into everything. It's a bit like having a beach ball in the sea and trying to push it down under the waves. Every time you push it down, it bounces up again. A lack of forgiveness causes resentment and bitterness. But when we really appreciate the mercy that's been shown to us, we want to live not just by, we don't want to live by justice, but we want to live by mercy, for mercy triumphs over justice. That's what James says in two, chapter 2, verse 13. And forgiveness, however often it's required, is mercy poured out. When we forgive, we are being merciful, just as we have received it, and it's poured out into our lives day by day. Who do you need to extend mercy to? Who you do you need to forgive? Let's bow in prayer, shall we? I'm just going to ask in just a moment, as I pray, for the Lord to forgive us and to cleanse us afresh. I know I need his cleansing every day. But maybe there is someone here or watching online who is conscious that they're holding resentment and bitterness for actions that have been taken against them. Justifiably, by the way, they feel that way. They are real actions. They're not envisaging them. They're not trying to make them up. But today, God's word is that we're to be merciful as he is merciful. We're to forgive as he forgives. And maybe you need today to say to the Lord, please forgive me for holding grudges and resentment and bitterness in my heart. And ask the Lord to forgive you. Perhaps too, as before I come to that prayer, there's people watching today who've never known the magnificence of Jesus' forgiveness in their lives. I want to say, God wants to extend that towards you. It's not just for an elite few. It's for every man, woman, and child. He wants to forgive you. Will you accept Jesus as your Savior, the forgiver of your sins, and ask him to become part of your life? Now we're going to pray. Father, I do ask you that you, almighty God, will forgive us our sins. I know, Lord, how many I incur. I know how indebtedness I am to you and your mercy. <clears throat> there is nothing that I can do to repay the debt that I owe you. But I thank you today, Lord, that you, through Jesus, paid my debt fully and continue to pay it with every single transgression. 
Help me to be a forgiving person. To extend mercy to people. That person who does the road rage and it was unjustified. That person who's a nasty neighbor and causes problems all the time. Whoever that person, that family member who is unrighteous in their dealings. Help me to forgive. And my brothers and sisters. And I pray for anyone watching today who has never known the forgiveness of Jesus in their lives. Cause them now to say, Jesus, please come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, the forgiver of my sins. I believe that when you died on the cross, you took the penalty of every sin I have or will commit. And I confess that I want to live for you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have um, a song now. I think it's called Revelation, and Chris and Alison are going to bring it. <laughs>